Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us as we wait for people to net to connect. I wanted to thank you so much for being here today. I'm Rachel Rosen. I'm the Communications Director for Democratic Majority for Israel. On behalf of our entire staff, our president, Mark Melman, our board, and our board co-chairs, Todd Richmond and Ann Lewis, who are with us today, welcome. We hope you and your loved ones are well and are enjoying the holiday season. In just a minute, I'll turn it over to our board member, Arizona State Representative Alma Hernandez to introduce our distinguished guest. But first, I wanted to go over a few items. If you like what you're hearing and seeing today, please consider checking us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can sign up for our newsletters and our updates on, and our, on our website at dmfi.org. And if you wanna ask a question today, you can submit it through the Q&A feature on Zoom. And if you're on Facebook, you can type it into the comment section. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to our board member, Arizona State Representative Alma Hernandez to introduce our distinguished guest today. Representative Hernandez. Hi, thank you so much, Rachel. And I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to introduce our guest today. Dr. Anat Wilf is a leading scholar on foreign policy, economics, education, Israel, and Zionism. Born and raised in Israel, she served in the Israel Defense Forces as an intelligence officer and a foreign policy advisor to Vice Prime Minister Shimon Peres. More recently, she was a member of the Israeli parliament from 2010 to 2013 and served as the chair of the Education Committee and member of the highly important Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. Dr. Wilf is currently the Goldman Visiting Professor at Georgetown University, and Dr. Wilf has published six books exploring key issues in Israeli society, including the electoral system and the path to peace. In her latest book, The War of Return, How Western Indulgence of the Palestinian Dream Has Obstructed the Path to Peace, Dr. Wilf and Adi Schwartz explore the controversial Palestinian belief of the right of return. Both liberal Israelis and supporters of a two-state solution, Wilf and Schwartz, focus on how the right of return has no legal or moral basis and how it represents one of the biggest obstacles to diplomacy and peace. We are so grateful to have such a distinguished guest with us today, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Wilf. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this lovely introduction, and thank you truly for the opportunity uh, I'm deeply moved uh, by what the Democratic Majority for Israel does, and I'm honored to be with you here today. Uh, I want to start a little bit by sharing with you why I even spent years really researching, writing, working, speaking on the issue of uh, the Palestinian right of return, the issue of the refugees. This is generally not an issue that gets a lot of attention when you ask people what are the obstacles to peace, you hear things about the occupation and the settlements, and maybe specific Israeli personalities like Netanyahu or Jerusalem. And this issue uh, rarely gets any attention. And I have come to the conclusion and in the book together with Adi Schwartz, we argue that not only is this an important issue, this is actually the only uh, issue to truly consider in understanding the conflict. Now, both Adi and I come from left-wing liberal backgrounds. Adi was a senior editor in Haaretz. I was a long-term uh, uh, supporter and member of the Israeli Labor Party. I worked with Yossi Balin, the architect of the Oslo Accords, with uh, Shimon Peres. And uh, I've always been a huge supporter of a two-state solution, of the idea that at the end of the day, the two peoples in the land, the Jews and the Arabs, need to learn to share the land, and was very much supportive of the various efforts of Israel uh, to make peace based on the formula, which really was associated with the Israeli peace camp for so many years, the idea of land for peace. I genuinely believe that all that Israel has to do is agree to hand over land, just as we did with the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, hand over land, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip to the Palestinians, and we will have peace. That what the Palestinians are fighting for is an end to Israel's military presence in the West Bank, and at the time, Gaza, no more settlements. They want their own state. It's a legitimate demand, and we should support it and enable it. Uh, like many Israelis, I 
of the peace camp. I voted for Rabin. I voted for Barack. I was euphoric throughout the 90s. And when Ehud Barak goes to Camp David in the year 2000, I was thrilled. He puts on the table a far reaching proposal that checked all the boxes of what we were told for years is what the Palestinians want and what they were fighting for. A fully sovereign Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. So if we are told that the occupation is the problem, that was obviously going to end it. There were gonna be no settlements in Palestine. They were either gonna be dismantled or exchanged for equivalent land. So if we're told that settlements are the reason we don't have peace, that was not gonna be an issue. Jerusalem was going to be divided, including parts of the old city, holy sites. So if we're told Jerusalem is the reason we don't have peace, that was taken care of. All the Palestinians had to do was say yes. But what do they do? They walk away. Arafat walks away in 2000. Uh, Abu Mazen walks away in 2008 from a similar proposal by Ehud Olmert. They walk away. Now, not only do they walk away, which you could say is a strategy of negotiations, they walk away to no criticism from their people. There's no Palestinian op-ed or someone that comes forth that says, are you crazy? We could have just had a state go back into the negotiation room and get us the state for which we have been fighting for so long. There's no criticism, which means that in walking away from those proposals, they did something their people wanted, or at least did not oppose. And of course, not only do they walk away to no criticism, what follows is massive violence, massacres in our streets, suicide bombings, literally days after the Palestinians could have had everything we were told they wanted. And as a result, a lot of Israelis from the peace camp, like myself, like Adi, ask a very simple question. What do the Palestinians want? What do they want? They clearly don't want an end to the occupation, an end to settlements, a capital in East Jerusalem, a sovereign state, or maybe they want those things but there's something that they want more, much, much more. Something for which they were willing again and again to walk away from the opportunity to have all these other things. What is this thing that they want more? And we realized that the answer was staring us in the face and that we didn't listen. And when we did listen, we didn't take it seriously. And what did the Palestinians want more than anything? Well, they've always said that they wanted, to their credit, from the river to the sea. An Arab Palestinian state with no sovereign Jewish state in any borders whatsoever. This has always been the top priority. It was amazingly articulated already in February of 1947, by the British foreign minister at the time, Ernst Bevin. If you know anything about Bevin, you know he was no friend to the Jews and no friend to Zionism. But when he goes to the British parliament to explain why the British are reneging on the mandate and giving it back to the heir of the League of Nations, the United Nations, he says this. He says, the con his majesty's government has come to the conclusion that the conflict is irreconcilable. He calls it irreconcilable. Why? He says there are Jews and Arabs in the land. And he says each one of them has a top priority, which he calls the point of principle. The Jews want a state. And the Arabs want the Jews not to have a state. It's a fascinating formulation. It's not, look, there's two peoples, they just can't agree about borders. He says one side, the Jews want a state, whatever the borders, and the other side, the Arabs, want the Jews not to have a state in any borders. And of course, this is the best predictor of the behavior of the sides ever since. This is why the Jewish side repeatedly says yes to all partition ideas and making peace based on two states, and why the Arab side repeatedly says no to anything, because any kind of partition, any kind of compromise, 
any kind of Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza frustrates their top priority of no Jewish state in any borders. And while this was clear for decades, with the fall of the Soviet Union and many changes, the Palestinians have started speaking of justice and rights, which many in the West somehow misinterpreted to mean that Palestinians have come to terms with Israel's existence. But the reason that we know that this is still not the case is that they remain deeply attached in the sense that this is their core identity to the idea that millions of Palestinians possess what they believe is a right of return, which means a right to settle inside the state of Israel in breach of Israel's sovereignty. Now in the book, we explain why there is no such legal sanctioned right for Palestinians to settle in Israel in breach of Israel's sovereignty, but they believe they possess it. They believe it's a sacred and holy right. And this is the mechanism by which they still hope to achieve from the river to the sea. When Palestinians say that they support a two-state solution and the right of return is holy and sacred, most people just don't ask them about the second half, but just ask them, then the only two states they ever envisioned is a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza and another Palestinian state to replace Israel through this mechanism of return. There is yet to be a Palestinian leader or even any Palestinian of note whose vision of peace is a Jewish state next to an Arab state as envisioned by the United Nations, which means that the conflict is actually quite simple. I used to always say, look, it's complicated. No, it's quite simple. This is a conflict between Jewish Zionism and Arab anti-Zionism. That's it. That's what Bevan noticed. It's been between the Jewish desire to live and thrive in their own sovereign nation state and the Arab rejection of that idea categorically in any borders, which means that the conflict could only end in one of two ways. Either Arab anti-Zionism is victorious by whichever means, violence, return, but at the end of the day, the vision is no sovereign state for the Jewish people in any borders whatsoever. If that happens by whichever means or mechanism, then this conflict is over. There may be other conflicts, but this one is over. The other way, way that the conflict ends is that Jewish Zionism is allowed to stand. That the Arab world, and especially the Palestinians, come to appreciate that they have misdiagnosed Zionism for decades. They have misdiagnosed Zionism as a movement of foreigners, of settler colonialists who have come to a land to which they have absolutely no connection. This misdiagnosis of the Arab view of Zionism has spectacularly backfired again and again. Because if your diagnosis is that Zionism is a movement of foreigners who have come to take a foreign land, then of course the response is violence and resistance because that's how you get rid of foreigners. And every time the Palestinians and the Arabs tried to treat Israel and Zionism like a settler colonial movement, it backfired because that's not what it is. Zionism is a movement of liberation and self-determination of a people in the only land in which they make sense as a collective. It's an indigenous liberation movement. When that is finally accepted and embraced by the Arab world, when the Palestinians finally develop a vision which says, let's build a Palestinian state next to Israel rather than instead of Israel. This is how we get to peace. Now, the book that we wrote speaks not only about the Palestinian dream or goal, it talks a lot about the Western indulgence of it. The notion that the West for decades 
has allowed the Palestinians to indulge this notion that Israel is a temporary aberration in an Arab and Islamic history of the Middle East, that one day Israel will disappear, that they can continue to believe that they are generation after generation into the fifth generation by now, still refugees from a war that ended 70 years ago, possessing of a right that was given to no people during wars of liberation when empires receded to turn back the clock and to uh, go back so-called to another state in which they never lived and which they were never citizens. And I will only say this in terms of this Western indulgence. One of the most tragic things that I believe are happening right now is that at the precise moment that the Arab world, especially in the Gulf, is beginning to show signs of departing from decades of anti-Zionism, of understanding what a misdiagnosis it was, what a waste of time and resources it was, you have voices coming up in the West, basically saying, we'll take the mantle of anti-Zionism from the Arab world, essentially goading the Palestinians as they begin to lose some of their Arab backing to keep fighting against this illegitimate presence, which is the sovereign state of Israel. And if we are to ever have peace, that is not the way to go. The way to go is to send the very clear message that Israel is here to stay, that, Jew that the Jewish people have a historical and ancient connection to the land of Israel, that ultimately neither side can have all of it, but that there is a vision of peace for the Palestinians and for the Israelis where they live side by side in their own state rather than the Palestinians continuing to fight for the Jews not to have their own state. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilf. Uh, we'd like to move into the Q&A portion of, of the conversation. If you'd like to ask a question, and some of you have, please put it into the Q&A box uh, on Zoom. You can type it in on Facebook. Uh, Dr. Wolf, I'll start off. You talk a lot in the book about UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency. Can you talk to our audience about what UNRWA is? What is its mission? You make in a case, you make your case in the book that, that UNRWA has been a big roadblock uh, to peace between Israelis and Palestinians. UNRWA, the UN Relief and Works Agency, is a still temporary agency that essentially is the vehicle of Western indulgence of the Palestinian dream that Israel is temporary and will one day disappear. Um, UNRWA was established in the wake of the War of 1948 as a temporary agency to settle the Arab refugees. Uh, there was nothing special about it. We talk in the book how another temporary agency was established at about the same time, UNCRA, the K being for Korea. Uh, Ankara settled three times the number of refugees, 2 million as compared to about 700,000. It did so in a few short years and with a quarter of the budget that UNRWA got, and it was dismantled because it was a temporary agency that achieved its goal. And look at where South Korea is today. It could have been the Palestinians. But for a variety of reasons having to do with the Cold War, with oil, with the Eisenhower Doctrine, the Palestinians were allowed to indulge for generations in the idea that the War of 1948 is not over, in refusing to resettle. It is the Arab Palestinian refugees themselves who rejected any program of settlement, understanding that this would mean the end of the war and the acceptance that Israel is here to stay, something that they rejected completely. And the West basically kept UNRWA open for generations, funding it year after year. Recently, UNRWA marked its 70th year celebrating it. This is about the last thing that it needs to celebrate as a temporary agency that was meant to finish its job in four years, that it still exists after 70 years. 
And what UNRWA has become from the Palestinian perspective is the vehicle of legitimacy for their idea that the war of 1948 is not over, that they are still, even generation after generation, they're still refugees, and that one day they will be victorious in that war by taking back their homes, even though, though they're not their homes and they've never been there for the millions who claim it. Uh, so this is what uh, UNRWA does. Now, because UNRWA has been a temporary agency for decades, it has, in order to do something while it maintains this idea of perpetual refugeehood, it started to provide schooling and healthcare services. But as in many things in the conflict, uh, cause and effect are reversed. So people think that UNRWA is an agency that provides social services until the problem will be solved. The, it's the opposite. UNRWA uh, is what's uh, maintained so that the problem will not be solved. And in the interim, it provides some social services. Non-humanitarian, not emergency. Those are the social welfare services of the Palestinian people. In the book, we also show how UNRWA by providing schooling basically became the womb through which a national Palestinian consciousness emerged, which in itself is not a bad thing to have a national Palestinian consciousness, except that it emerged as singularly focused on this notion of return and revenge. This means that the entire Palestinian ethos and identity as shaped in the schools of UNRWA has been focused on the idea that Israel and Zionism are illegitimate and have to be destroyed by all means. This is still what UNRWA does. Uh, in that sense, it's been a disappointment to me that the current administration has decided to refund the organization. UNRWA is not an organization that could be reformed. When the previous president defunded UNRWA, you did not hear Palestinians complain that they cannot pay for their teachers. What they said was this, the American president is trying to take away our right of return. Palestinians perceive Western funding for UNRWA as political legitimacy for their idea of return. America can ignore it all it wants, but the Palestinians are right. When you give money to an organization that was purposefully uh, transformed by the Palestinian into the vehicle of perpetual refugeehood and the demand for return, you cannot say that your financial support of this organization is divorced from the political vision of the organization itself. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. I think you answer all my questions uh, on UNRWA. I uh, wanted to ask you a question from Jamie, who asks, do you think it is near impossible to negotiate a permanent peace with the Palestinians? And what do you think about the prospects of a two-state solution in the future? Uh, so I'll start from the end. I continue to be very much a supporter of the vision of a two states. Uh, and by the way, not the settlements, all that. The vision is still very much possible. Uh, at the end of the day, in the small strip of land, there are two collectives, Jews and Arabs, whatever each thinks about the other, it's very clear that we are two distinct peoples and nations. And I think that we would benefit from being governed in our own political entities. So I think this is the ultimate peaceful vision. But there is no use right now negotiating this vision as long as from the Palestinian perspective, they are still deeply attached to the vision of from the river to the sea. In the book, we have a very basic phrase, which we say, if peace is to be achieved, the war must be over. Basic, right? Uh, you can't negotiate peace if one side still thinks that they're in the midst of the war and they think they can actually still win it. Um, so before we negotiate the details of how exactly we divide the land and what are the security arrangements, all things that can be negotiated, 
we can divide the land, we can divide the water, we can divide resources. All of the things can be divided. The one thing that cannot be divided is the difference between Zionism and anti-Zionism. You cannot split the difference here. As long as the Palestinians remain deeply attached to the idea that a sovereign Jewish state is illegitimate in any borders, there's no use for engaging in negotiations. And we've seen that repeated negotiations did not only fail, they led to violence. So in many ways, I believe that we need to first address the underlying conflict. And we need to do that by sending messages that I know, especially for Democrats, are not pleasant. Uh, the messages that need to be sent are the war of 1948 is over. Israel is here to stay. The Jewish people have a historical and cultural and deeply felt connection to the land of Israel. They are not foreigners. They belong there and have the right to self-determination. You are not still refugees from a war that ended 70 years ago, and there will be no return because there is no such right. Not for you, not for the Germans, not for the Ukrainians, not for the Poles, not for the Hindus, not for the Muslims. Nobody has that right, and you're not special. Now, I know that these are not pleasant messages. I'm from the political left. Uh, in Israel, one of the things that uh, people from the left, I think, like to believe is that they belong to the camp of the good. You know, we are for good things, compromise, equality, justice. I had to go through a very wrenching and difficult emotional process to understand that even though I support two states and no settlements and end to the occupation and dividing Jerusalem and all of these things, as far as I'm considered from the Palestinian perspective, it doesn't make me a nice person because I still think that the Jewish people should have a state in the other part of the territory. And that's still from their perspective, a terrible idea, a vile idea. So I had to wrestle with the fact that I'm not a nice person. And I accept it because ultimately I do believe that the right of the Jewish people to self-determination is one of the most justified ideas. And I, again, and I think that it doesn't have to come at the expense of the Palestinians. We can live side by side, but if their vision is that there's no room for me, what is there to negotiate? So I think they first have to accept that this is it, that they can live next to Israel, but not instead of Israel. And then we can negotiate. And by the way, I think that will be at that point, the easiest negotiation. Really, those details of how we live side by side are ones we can figure out. The far harder process, unpleasant process, and one that will take at least a generation once it begins, we didn't even begin yet, is to get the Palestinians to finally accept Zionism as a legitimate movement, as an illegitimate equal claimant to the land. Dr. Wilf, I have a, a question from uh, one of our board members, uh, Mark Gerstein. And Mark says, uh, Dr. Wolf, uh, Dr. Wilf, excuse me, thank you for writing such a brilliant book. This problem seems at odds with the current PA and Hamas leadership. What specific steps should the US take and with what other international support to affect the change in the posture at the leadership level? And will the street come along? So one of the big mythologies, and we discuss it throughout the book, and thank you, um, is the idea that the leadership is more extreme than the people. If anything, it's been actually quite the opposite. The people, even from the beginning, even without a leadership, it is the Arab refugees themselves who refused any form of settlement, understanding that it would mean coming to terms with Israel's existence and legitimacy. Uh, and we look at the various negotiations with Arafat and Abu Mazen walking away, understanding that at the end of the day, they cannot tell their people that there will not be a return. And that was, the, that was the thing that broke it. Not Jerusalem, not settlements, not... A, they understood that they cannot go back to their people and tell them, that's it, it's not going to happen. Um, so 
Uh, what I say these days is that I don't want a brave Palestinian leadership. I don't want brave leaders. I want a leadership that reflects its people, which is what we have, which is what I need, therefore, it's for the people to change. And then the leadership will reflect that change. Uh, and again, this is a tall order. I understand that it's much easier to think of let's find a brave leader. But at the end of the day, Arafat, Abu Mazen knew that they could not depart from the most foundational ethos of their people of this idea of return. So it is the Palestinian people who need to go through a process of reckoning and understanding that they're no longer refugees and that there is no return. And that involves the West, for example, giving them the harsh messages that I mentioned. So defund UNRWA, get other countries to do the same. Tell the Palestinians, we are with you. We support you if your vision is of a state next to Israel. But as long as it's of a state instead of Israel, we're not with you. And we will not support you or fund you until your vision changes. And you're not refugees. We're going to tell you that. We're not going to shy away from telling you that. Uh, we're going to tell you by issuing uh, legal documents that make it clear that you don't have a right of return, that UNGA Resolution 194 doesn't give you that right. You simply don't have that right, which means that we're not asking you to give it up because you don't have it to begin with. And so we're willing to support a vision that is constructive, that builds a Palestinian state next to Israel. But as long as the idea of return of, from the river to the sea is foundational to your identity, we're not going to do anything that even implies that we support it. Uh, those are the messages that need to get through. And let me bring an example that shows how it was done in another case and why it worked. In the book, we tell the story of the German refugees. Germany uh, signs an unconditional surrender. The war is over. The Allies occupy Germany. And after the war, this is not in the course of the war like the Palestinians. And after the war, 14 million ethnic Germans are brutally pushed out of what becomes Western Poland and the Sudeten and Czechoslovakia. We have uh, stories of how brutal it was in the book. Two million Germans uh, die in the process and they're thrown into Germany. Do they want to their homes back? Of course they do. They call it Heimkehr, return. Does anyone indulge them? Does anyone think, sure, let's build an organization that supports them in that? Of course not. Everyone understands that indulging that would mean perpetual war in Europe. This is why the message for refugees throughout the 20th century, Greeks and Bulgarians and Hindus and Muslims and Ukrainians and Poles and Jews was sad, tragic, tough, move on. The Germans got the message, move on. But it still took a whole generation, 24 years, for Chancellor Willy Brandt to sign an agreement with Poland, recognizing the new border and giving a speech to the German refugees and their descendants saying, it's over. We are never going to get those lands back. We need to look to the future rather to the past. This is common sense. This is not defeat. In the book, we bring the speech and we say, cut and paste the speech to Palestinian people and leader, and we have peace. So this can be achieved. A people can be transformed. The people can appreciate that there's not, no going back and that some lands are gone forever. But it's not going to happen if they're indulged in the alternative belief that they can still turn back the clock. I wanted to turn to the Abraham Accords and I wanted to get your impressions of, of these accords and what you think it means, if anything, in terms of um, Israeli and Palestinian peace. Specifically, we have a question from Josh who asks, uh, to what extent do normalization efforts with Arab states, Arab states such as the UAE impact Palestinian attitudes towards Zionism? 
So this is the most hopeful thing that is happening right now. The Abraham Accords are truly transformational. Now, when they just started, there seemed to almost be a concerted effort to downplay them. Uh, there was no real war. The UAE is a small state. This is a bribe. Uh, it's all about an arms deal. There was a sense of like, okay, this is not important. And I understand that it was perhaps difficult to, uh, you know, with it being President Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu, but these are transformational. And if you didn't think that a year and a half ago, I think by now this has to be recognized. For decades, Jews in Israel were told what you have with Egypt, what you have with Jordan, that's the best you can hope for. As long as the situation with the Palestinians continues, this is what peace is, which means barely any diplomatic relations. You have security cooperation, yes, but no cultural relations, no tourism, no warmth. Um, Jordan and Egypt were the number one promoters of anti-Israel resolutions in international bodies. Egypt was the number one producer and promoter of anti-Semitic content in Arabic. And we were told that this is peace. Along come the UAE and Bahrain and then Morocco, and they're all in. It's not this standoffish piece. And of course, there are real reasons, you know, Iran and America's footprint in the region, but they went far beyond questions of security or intelligence cooperation. They went all in. Uh, my Twitter feed is full of Abraham Accord stuff. And there were uh, every day I read about a new agreement in agriculture and space and technology and tourism that is being signed. Uh, I don't know if you know the Dubai uh, Tel Aviv line is now the number one line of Emirates and that's only one year after it started operating. They've gone all in. And it's not just about Israel. They're embracing Jewish life. Uh, the few Jews that live in the Emirates now find Emiratis uh, celebrating all the Jewish holidays with them, which really comes to show you that when you embrace Israel and Zionism, you also embrace Jews and vice versa. When you uh, are virulently anti-Zionist, any organization, country, party, uh, place that became anti-Zionist was ultimately inhospitable to Jews. I know all the arguments of why it doesn't necessarily have to be this way, but empirically, it's always been this way. And now we're seeing the reverse, the Arab world turning away from decades of anti-Zionism, which means also embracing Jewish life. And all of it is uh, clear in one word, Abraham. There is no simple, shorter way of sending the message of flipping the narrative. If the dominant narrative in the Arab world it still is, is that Israel is a foreign settler colonial state, the best way to flip it is by saying Abraham. Abraham it means acknowledging that the Jewish people belong in the region, that they have a history here, a culture, an attachment. And this is what the, uh, the Gulf states have been doing with these normalization agreements. After the normalization agreements, I co-wrote an op-ed with two young Emiratis, and it matters that they're young, a man and a woman. And the op-ed opens with these words. We are proud Arabs, proud Muslims, and Zionists. They didn't play around. They, they didn't shy from the word. And they said very clearly, we see no contradiction between a proud Arab identity, a proud Muslim identity, and embracing the Jewish right to self-determination in the land. And this, I believe, is the path to peace. Uh, one of my most hopeful lectures these days is called Arab Zionism and the Path to Peace, because Arab embrace of the Jewish right to self-determination in the historic homeland is what will bring us peace. Now, you asked about Palestinian attitudes. Right now, of course, there's no change. Palestinians are experiencing the Abraham Accords as betrayal, and they're doing everything to stop the momentum, uh, which is why it's so important to continue the momentum. Because the more you peel away the Arab blank check for Palestinian rejectionism, 
the sooner you bring about the reckoning, the same one that I spoke about for the German refugees, the reckoning that says, okay, the war is over and we have to finally come to terms with its outcomes, which means the existence of the state of Israel. So I believe as more and more states join the Abraham Accords, uh, the more the Palestinians will have to come to terms with Israel's existence and permanence and legitimacy in the region. And I just sincerely hope that we will not have Western anti-Zionists trying to work against this momentum and giving new life and new fuel to Palestinian rejectionism. Uh, because at the end of the day, when anti-Zionists abroad tell Palestinians keep fighting, Israel is really illegitimate, the person who pays the price is me, it's us here in Israel. It's not the Swedish government that funds UNRWA, it's not the anti-Zionist on campus, it's we pay for it in decades of continued conflict. So the sooner we can continue the momentum, the Abraham Accords, uh, I think the sooner we will force the Palestinian reckoning with Israel's permanence and legitimacy, which will ultimately bring us to peace. Dr. Wolf, I, I wanna ask about your experience teaching college students. Uh, you teach a class at Georgetown on Zionism and, and anti-Zionism. I'm curious about who, who takes this class. Are these students who are looking to have their views validated or are they there to, to challenge you and depress you or something else in general? So the great thing about teaching a course on Zionism and anti-Zionism is I get everybody. Uh, so uh, I have Jewish students of all persuasions. I have Muslim students. I have uh, Christian and generally interested students. And one of the things that we did in this course is we use primary materials. So I let the Zionists and anti-Zionists speak for themselves. And I think this had a profound effect on the discourse and on the students, because you finally read about Zionism not through a distorted lens. Uh, you finally read about anti-Zionism and see it for what it is. Uh, I think a very powerful moment, for example, came when we read the original document of the Arab who uh, coined the term the Nakba, the catastrophe. And we think of it today as this like, you know, dispossession and sadness of people. When uh, Constantine Zurek defines the Nakba, the disaster, he defines it as the following. Seven Arab armies tried to defeat and subjugate Zionism and they went home impotent. That's his definition. And you read the entire article, it's all about the shame of having failed to defeat Zionism. That was the disaster. And much of the essay is about how to prepare to do it better the next time. Um, so the, it, I think it's very powerful when you're able to read the original documents and to see what people are really saying. So much of it gets moderated sometimes through this like benign Western lens. Uh, in the book, for example, I introduced a word called Westplaining, which a bit like mansplaining uh, betrays the same attitude of telling people what they really think, even though they express themselves quite clearly. So when you read what Arabs say in terms of why they're opposing Israel, and they make it very clear that as far as they're concerned, Jewish self-determination is a shameful idea that they will oppose violently. Um, I think it's very powerful to when you hear people tell you today, oh, it's about rights and justice. Um, so I found that it was very powerful. I think, uh, because you let people speak for themselves. Uh, the discussions were very good. Uh, I think we had a fascinating moment, for example, in reading about Jewish anti-Zionism, about Satmar Jews and the Turricarda Jews. And uh, suddenly you had students, I remember a very left-wing student who said, but they don't care about Palestinians. You know, suddenly realizing that this theological form of Jewish anti-Zionism is not about what Israel is doing. And uh, one uh, student said, oh, so they just, they don't want Zionism now, but they want Zionism later. You know, they still think 
this is the land of the Jewish people. So I found that this uh, actually allowed for very, very healthy, good debates. Uh, I didn't have any student who was just trying to needle me. They were truly, truly engaged with the material. I do hope one day to find the opportunity to make it into a digital course because uh, my experience has been that it's been very valuable. And I'll just end by saying that a student told me a couple of days ago at the end of the class that this has been worth more and better than dozens of hours of therapy. And uh, uh, someone told me that in this therapeutic age, it's the highest compliment. Uh, just the notion that kind of knowing what Zionism is, knowing what the sources of anti-Zionism are, really gives you the confidence and even peace of mind to withstand a lot of the bullying really that anti-Zionism is today. That is quite a compliment from, from your student, uh, no doubt. I want to ask a little bit more about the culture of uh, discussing Israel on campus. We have a question from Susan. How do we address what's going on with young people on college campuses and other places who support BDS and other anti-Israel attitudes? Is it your sense that there's that that Jewish students feel unwelcome on college campuses if if in fact they support Israel? Uh, certainly, and that's uh, not a secret. And uh, where I've uh, come to term this phenomena the pound of flesh, which of course Shakespeare was reversed, but most of the times it's the Jews who are asked to hand over a pound of flesh. And I know that because I experienced it. It used to be uh, good enough to say that you're for a Palestinian state or for a two state solution or against the occupation or against settlements, all of the things that I believe in. And that got you into the community so-called of the good, you know, the progressive, the liberal community. But the goalposts are moving all the time. So today, this is just not good enough. And on college campuses, what you could see the progression over time is that it used to be enough to be, let's say, a student, a pro-Israel student who uh, supported a two-state solution. And then you had to join J Street and then J Street U and then if not now, and then Jewish Voices for Peace. And by now, if you're not the Jewish militant co-chair of Students for Justice in Palestine, you're just not a good enough Jew. And I think what's been happening in some places, uh, it's still small, but for me, very encouraging, is that you're beginning to see students who are understanding that this is the dynamic of bullying. And bullying preys on shame and weakness. So if you're feeling ashamed of the connection with Israel, if you're feeling ashamed of your Zionism, then you're going to be constantly pushed to hand over another pound of flesh. But I think a lot of students at one point realize that it's never going to be enough. There's never going to be enough pounds of flesh that they can hand over to appease the bully. And then some of them just take a step back and say, you know what, go to hell. And they reclaim Zionism, not as a movement uh, for establishing the state, happily that is kind of taken care of. They are reclaiming Zionism as shorthand for confident Judaism. So a way that has become today to express your confidence in your Jewish identity and kind of say, go to hell to the anti-Zionist bully is to say, I'm a Zionist. So you have the new Zionist Congress and Zioness and Club Z. And I see more and more young Jews are actually saying, I'm a Zionist. This is part of my Twitter handle, of course, um, because it's just a way of projecting confidence, of rejecting the notion that we could be shamed into running away from the connection between Jewish history and Israel and the achievements of Zionism. And for me, uh, that's actually the response. You know, I have a lot of lectures and books and articles on specific issues, but my headline is that the only effective response to anti-Zionist bullying is Zionism. It's basically, confidently reclaiming your Zionist identity in a way that the bullies have to go elsewhere.
Thank you so much, Dr. Wolf. I, I think uh, we're, we're sadly run, almost running out of time, though I have so many more questions to ask you, so we'll have to have you back. I, if you, in case you had any closing remarks, I want to give you an opportunity. If not, I will uh, go ahead and I'll bring on uh, Mark Melman. I'll just say one thing why I am so supportive of what the Democratic majority for Israel does, except for the fact that, you know, in Israel, I come from the left. I think one of the most dangerous things uh, for Jews is to feel politically homeless, because I think political homelessness is the first step to other forms of homelessness. And what you're doing is defending the possibility for Jews and Zionists to have a home in the Democratic Party. And I can think of no higher calling at this moment. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolf. This was really an insightful discussion. And uh, for the group, we have shared uh, your syllabus. And I imagine I, we have some questions. People will like you to do that digital program online for adults. And we'll share uh, ways to, to purchase your book as well. And uh, thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over to DMFI President uh, Mark Melman. Thank you so much, Rachel. Wasn't that just a brilliant and insightful analysis? Thank you so much, Anat. We really appreciate it. Uh, your words of wisdom, your thoughtfulness, uh, your intellectual uh, creativity and rigor, all are extraordinarily important, extraordinarily appealing uh, to all of us. So we're, we're very grateful for your spending time with us today. We're very grateful for the larger work you do uh, on behalf of Israel, on behalf of the Jewish people uh, around in the United States, in Israel, and around the world. Um, as, uh, as Dr. Wilf said, uh, we do face a battle in the Democratic Party. Uh, so far, we're lucky to uh, have the, a party that is uh, led by strong pro-Israel figures like President Biden and Vice President Harris and Speaker Pelosi and Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, uh, very important, very strong pro-Israel advocates uh, in the United States Congress, in the White House, uh, very important for us. But there is a battle going on. Uh, and DMFI, as, as Dr. Wolf said, is fighting this battle every day. Uh, we do so with your support. We can only do so with your support. So we, we thank you for the support you've given us. We look forward to, to hearing from you. We look forward to joining us for future programs uh, where you can get more information, more insight, more analysis uh, to be able to make the case for Israel. Again, uh, Inat, thank you so very much. We're so glad you were in uh, Washington, if only for a brief time, uh, and uh, look forward to uh, continuing to work together towards our common goals. Thank you very much. Thank you.